What's wrong with having metta for those who have died? Shouldn't we have metta for everyone? Also, everyone has died many times anyway. Yeah, um, that's a good question. A specific question about the practice of metta. Why not do metta for the dead? And um, the reason being is that uh, we don't know where the dead person has ended up. Uh, they might very well be in a ghost uh, condition, uh, peta, uh, in which case uh, the beneficial or compassionate thing to do is to help them to transition and take a, a more fortunate rebirth. Uh, Peta existence of being is going to be very uh, hungry for um, human experience and they're often also confused and don't really know where they are or what's going on. To have, they don't realize that they've died. And you, if you um, extend metta to them, it can cause them to linger, uh, feeding off that energy and not, um, not moving on. So it's not helpful to them. The uh, proper uh, practice of for benefit the dead is to make merit or transfer merit, which means when you do some good deed or generous action, something kind, you make a conscious resolution. May this, the merit of this deed, go to assist my departed relatives. This is something done very much uh, in uh, uh, Buddhist countries. It's very commonly done. Um, and the second part of the question, everyone has died many times, that's true. But we're, um, we're speaking here about um, specific, indi naming specific individuals that have, that you have known that are now di died. Um, not talking about the dead in general or you know, in the broader scheme, but it's not a, not a good practice to send metta to individuals that are, are dead. Could you explain the history of your tradition lineage? Okay. Well, in the uh, broadest picture is uh, that uh, I'm a member of the Theravadan Buddhist Sangha. Uh, Theravada is one of the schools of Buddhism and it's one of the, um, it is singly the oldest school in existence. The name means uh, uh, school of the elders. It goes back uh, to the uh, being one of the original 18 schools. This is all pre-Mahayana. The, the first um, division of Buddhism into schools began with the uh, Second Council, 100 years after the Buddhist time. And uh, at that time, there was a, this, the council was a failure in, in the, the attempt to reconcile all the Buddhists on one one agreement, and there was a split between um, two factions, and 
in the course of the next little while, next I know hundred years or so, that these two factions split up into into eighteen different schools. And that's as far back as we can trace the Theravada, that they were one of those original 18 schools. They're established currently in uh, Theravada. Buddhism is established in Sri Lanka and uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, Burma, and uh, Laos and Cambodia, and uh, to some degree in Vietnam. <coughs> And the particular group to which I, I uh, uh, belong is the forest lineage of Ajahn Chah, called a forest lineage because um, in uh, Buddhist countries there's always a division between the monks of the forest and the monks of the town. In Thai it's Wat Pan, Wat Ban. Uh, uh, Ban is the, the village monks, the uh, are more um, focused on doing ceremonies and uh, you know, serving the lay community. And the Wat Pa or the forest monks, they live more remotely and are more focused on meditation. And um, so there's uh, always that that division. And it's somewhat blurred, but that's that's the historical division. And Ajahn Chah was a particularly charismatic and well-known monk who lived in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, he died in the early 90s, and um, uh, he was this, he, during his time he had many disciples and he established many many branch monasteries in Thailand and also overseas in uh, countries in Europe and America and Australia. I was initially trained at Wat Pananishat, which is the international monastery of Ajahn Chah. Nanashat means many nations. It was the training monastery for foreign monks in the Ajahn Chah tradition in Thailand. And um, that was established by Ajahn Chah after he started to get many uh, disciples from uh, foreign countries. don't understand compassion without pain. Compassion is a feeling with someone and empathetic bond. If they are feeling pain, then you feel that pain. To care for someone suffering without pain seems better to sympathy, which lacks the emphatic uh, connection. Yeah, this is um, what I was alluding to, that the the translation of compassion is not 100% accurate because compassion does as the, this question says compassion does imply a uh, vicarious or empathetic suffering along with the person it's, the, it's what the name means to feel with it's, it's from Latin compassion to, to feel or suffer with um, whereas the, the, the Buddhist state karuna does not imply taking on the, the suffering of, of other beings it's rather a uh, earnest wish to make, a, make an end of suffering altogether and uh, uh, it's not so much a identification with the suffering of, of others but a recognition of it and a, um, a, a wish that it be uh, alleviated mm. Karuna 
is one of the um, uh, qualities of, of a Buddha. He's perfect in wisdom and, and uh, compassion, panya and karuna. It's a balancing. It's a balancing factor for wisdom. It's a, important that two of them are are important to exist in, be developed in, in tandem. You know? um, the wisdom without uh, compassion is cold and, and uh, uh, ruthless. Uh, with wisdom, we, we, we transcend the idea of a self and uh, em we see the emptiness of, of beings. And um, this can, if, it, if this is just taken by, uh, taken wrongly, um, taken out of context, it can lead to a kind of moral nihilism when it sees no, uh, no, uh, uh, no reality in anything. So there's no harm done. You know, um, I cited this in my talk the other, the other night. Uh, a historical example of this is uh, some of the Japanese Zen um, samurai uh, developed the idea that, that they, they could go to war and kill and chop people up with their swords and there's no, no harm done because um, it's only empty atoms. When they, move, when they chop someone's head off with a sword, it's only empty atoms moving through empty atoms. So there's no... No, no harm, no foul. Yeah. Um, so this is a kind of a mis this is definitely a misapplication of, uh, of wisdom teachings without compassion. Com compassion recognizes the reality of suffering, and even if we see that beings are a conventional reality, they're not ultimately real. We see that suffering is real. And we are concerned about the suffering experienced by beings and wish to uh, uh, do our best to minimize it or alleviate it. Yeah, but compassion has to be also balanced with wisdom or we, we become uh, unable to do anything skillful to, to help alleviate suffering. We uh, are overwhelmed by the suffering Attempting to correct situations without wisdom, we often make them worse. And meddle in people's lives without uh, skill, you know, but motivated by a, a sense of compassion, but without any wisdom or skill, we end up increasing the suffering, just making a mess of things. So, I, I think that. The, uh, the understanding here is that um, the karuna is not exactly the same thing as what we understand by compassion. Uh, it has generally over a strong overlap, but it doesn't does not include vicarious or secondhand suffering. Uh, for lay people who are married and have children, can one practice loving kindness to family members such as these? Yes, you should definitely have have loving kindness for your family members. That's uh, very important. Um, uh, the one qualification is that if you are developing as a formal meditation and you're developing the list, you, know, you specifically don't take your spouse as the dear one. Uh, there's a story in the Vasudhi Maga to that, uh, that effect that a, a man was doing this meditation and he was developing it towards his wife and he got so overwhelmed with desire that he broke the wall down to get into her, her room couldn't even wait to go through the door. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but 
the, you know, that's only for you know developing it as a as a concentrated, in you know, intense form of sit down meditation. But just in general, in your dealings and your attitude towards your family members, it's very important to have uh, to have metta towards them. Um, there, there's another thing in the Vasudhi Magga that with the Brahma Vihara is using the example of a, a mother and her child. That the different, uh, as the child ages, the different Brahma Viharas are, are come to the fore. Uh, when, the, when it's a newborn baby, the mother feels pr uh, primarily metta because she wants the baby to be happy and do well. Then as it gets a little bit older and it's a small child and it's running around falling down and banging its knees and you know, losing its toys and she, you know, she feels karuna, she feels compassion and wishes it wouldn't suffer so much. And then when, it, when the child grows up and it starts to, to make a, you know, goes, goes to school, gets an education, starts to get forward in the world, she feels Medita at, at his success. And then when he's fully grown and he's moved out of the house and he's got a family of his own and she feels equanimity. She's done her job and he's on his own and she's content now. <laughs> this is the uh, example of the different different kinds of Brahma Viharas. I'm a little confused by the mentioning of not spreading Brahmahara to the dead. He's a hungry ghost. Uh, we're not supposed to spend, send good will to the ghost. What is the proper intention? How do we incorporate this? Okay, um, again, this is a similar question to the previous one. Um, and yes, we do include the, the ghosts in the general pervasion of Brahma Viharas. Uh, we wish well to all beings, but the the um, restriction is not to focus specifically on the individual. Uh, you know, not to conjure up in your mind an individual who's recently died and, and send metta to them. That's not considered skillful. But as a general category, yes, we include ghosts and all categories of needs. Sorry about my knee. Will you please forgive me? Today was funeral for my cousin who died on Thanksgiving of opiate overdose. She cut her finger the night before. It's been the toughest week of my life. I relapsed and as a result got my phone bugged by the police this week. I'm okay now. Luckily, I have faith I will never face addiction again. I was purposely focusing on the pain in my knee to overcome the emotional trauma. Very appropriate, very inappropriate, I'm sorry. Oh, um, that's not, I don't think that's inappropriate at all. You do uh, have to deal with what you have to deal with. Uh, sometimes we have very difficult situations to deal with as this this questioner is obviously experiencing a pretty uh, intense moment in, in, in the life. We have to deal with things as we uh, as we can. And this is um, something we all face in our lives at different times in different ways. We face the loss of loved ones and we face crises of various kinds. So this is a, a universal thing that happens and, and the specific details are different in every case but um, everyone has moments of great suffering in their life. So it's important when you're not in that kind of a crisis situation to develop the strength and the, the integrity and uh, you know the internal fortitude and purity that um, develop your practice when when you have the opportunity when, uh, when you have the space so that then you have something to draw on some uh, reserve when the time comes that there's a, a, a 
crisis situation in the life, because we're all going to face that many times throughout a lifetime. If a Buddha were living today and did not want to waste one moment until all suffering ended, what may this look like for a Buddha point of, from a Buddha point of view? Two, how would an Arahant have a benefit on the world? Three, what would be your advice to a Bodhisattva who did not want to waste one moment until all suffering ended? Four, will all suffering of all beings ever end if there is life, even if that life is shrunk to a very tiny population? Why would you ever advise someone practicing Buddhism if it's okay to break the law, even if it's for the sake of all beings? Okay, so five different points here. One, if a Buddha were living today and did not want to waste one moment of all suffering ended, what might this look like from a Buddha point of view? And, and this is kind of an idle speculation. There's no way we can really know what a Buddha point of view is. You know, so Buddha mind is incomprehensible. Um, and the, all we can do is look at the um, example of the, uh, the last Buddha, Gotama, who, who we have a pretty extensive historical record of his teachings and his life in the Pali Canon, and we can try and draw conclusions from that as an example. We think, you know, that not today is so special or different, but it's not. I mean, the uh, human condition has not changed since the Buddhist time. We're still subject to the same defilements and we still have the same potentials. How would an Arahant have a benefit on the world? Um, the Arahant has a benefit in the world by, uh, first of all, being an example of a purified being, and uh, second, by um, providing very clear uh, teachings coming from a very elevated place, a very, a very uh, refined state of mind purified, perfected state of mind. <clears throat> so the presence of an arahant is always a, a huge benefit to, the, to those around them and to the whole society. What would your advice be to a bodhisattva who did not want to waste one moment until all suffering ended? Uh, <clears throat> there is a text in... Um, one of the later Pali books, one of the commentarial books, talking about the Bodhisattva path, is the one is, um, which is a little bit different in Theravada than Mahayana. In the Theravada, the Bodhisattva path is one who's made an aspiration to Buddhahood. So you're practicing to become a, a, a Buddha. And uh, the emphasis of the text is on the extreme length of time hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes and the extreme difficulty of attaining Buddhahood. And it says if uh, it says in the text, if one is completely sincere about this path of, of Bodhisattva path, and if someone were to tell you, before you can even take the first step on the path, you've got to crawl on your belly for 500 yojanas over these sharp rocks, you would say, if you were serious about it, you would say, well, not a moment to waste, and you would immediately dive down onto your belly and start crawling. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the uh, bodhisattva path is seen as tremendously difficult and, and a huge uh, sacrifice, uh, motivated by compassion for the desire to liberate beings. Four, will all suffering of all beings ever end if there is life, even if that life is shrunk to a very tiny population? No. 
<laughs> no, it's a samsaric uh, conditioned existence. Um, there's no end to it within samsara, within conditionality. And um, the uh, traditional cosmological model is that the, the, the universe or the cosmos as a whole is without beginning and without end. However far back in time you go, there's always a yesterday. And however f far forward you go, there's always a tomorrow. But any individual world system, such as, as this one, does have a finite lifespan. It began at some point, it ends at some point. And at the end, all the beings will uh, be destroyed. But they'll, the force of, it's the force of their unextinguished karma that causes the new universe to come into being so they can be born into it. So there's no really, there, there's only a, an interlude when there's a small number or no beings. Beings are, beings are endless uh, and um, the, numbers of, the numbers of beings are one of the things that's, that's listed as, as uh, limitless. Without, without a limit or infinite, endless. <clears throat> Would you ever advise someone practicing Buddhism that it's okay to break the law even for the sake of all beings? Um, well, it depends what you mean by the law. You mean that the... the the moral or ethical law, no. There's never any time when it's when um, it's skillful to break, break a precept, to, to break the. But the man-made laws of the state are arbitrary. They may, uh, you know, in a wise, in a wise country, in a, a, a governed well, the laws will correspond to the universal ethical principles, and they should be adhered to. But there may be times when the laws are counter, uh, are actually against morality. Those are the ethical principles supersede the, the law. In that they, there's really never any time when it's wise or suitable to break the precept. And I think this is actually a difference in the um, understanding of morality between the Theravada and the Mahayana. Because the Mahayana would answer that question differently and say that uh, one can break the precepts under compassion. Uh, but it's not accepted in the Theravada. Uh, there's an example, there's a, a story in um, one of the Mahayana texts that um, it's a Jataka story, meaning a previous life of the Buddha. And this does not occur in the Pali version, but in the Mahayana text, there's the story that uh, the Buddha was born at that time as a, uh, a merchant. And he went to sea with 500 other merchants in a boat, a ship. And he had psychic powers and he could see in the mind of one of the other uh, merchants that he was actually a thief and he had a plan to kill everybody on the ship and take over the ship and take all the goods of the merchants and take them to some pirate port and sell them. So the, the Bodhisattva then killed this guy and then he was seized, the Bodhisattva was seized by the crew of the ship as a murderer, because they didn't know why he'd done it, and they they uh, threw him overboard. So he killed a man and then, and let let himself be sacrificed to save the others. And that story would not be acceptable in the Theravada understanding because there's still killing involved, still a breach of a precept, and you don't make an excuse. Uh, and I think there is some. Um, you know, the, the criticism, the Mahayana criticism of the Theravada 
understanding of ethics is that we're too narrow and legalistic and, and rigid. Maybe there's something to that, but the uh, at least it's safe. The ter the um, Mahayana version allows you too much uh, leeway to make excuses. Uh, it may be a well and good for someone with with uh, perfect wisdom and compassion, but uh, it's far too easy for people to make excuses for immoral deeds being done for a higher purpose and fool people to fool themselves. But if you're bound by explicit precepts, then you can't you don't have room to make these uh, excuses. Should we give money to evil big pharma or the local struggling family man? <laughs> That's a, uh, sort of obvious. <laughs> Why should we give money to evil big pharma? I don't. I don't understand. That's the point of the question. You. I think the answer is already in the question. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say a little more about the near and far enemies of Upeka? Yeah, I don't think I even mentioned the near and far enemies of Upeka. Um, the far enemy of uh, Upeka is um, a particular uh, particularism or um, judgmentalness of you know not seeing the equality or equal side of beings but discriminating amongst beings this one is good this one is bad and, um, uh, or favoritism um, and the the near enemy is indifference or apathy mm. I lost my keys and need help finding them. <laughs> I usually feel free but also suffer from PTSD, bipolar, ADHD, anxiety. It does not mean that I don't take responsibility. I do. I would never purposely cause harm. Okay, so I don't know how to help you with your keys. Um, a general, uh, a general principle about uh, not losing stuff is if you make a point to be mindful when you put them down then you'll, you can find them later hmm. as you register the, the occurrence but if you toss them aside without being mindful then later on you won't know where you put them My brother-in-law flies helicopters for the Coast Guard. I am jealous because while I love driving 18 liters, I would love to fly a helicopter. Especially after hearing my friend talk about flying in Vietnam. Amazing machines, but I'm not responsible enough for that lifestyle. It's very dangerous. My brother-in-law is jealous that I can live where I want and used to smoke medical marijuana. He can only use CBD isolate. I was on CBD when I reached the formless. Uh, I don't even see a question in this. I don't think there was a question in that. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, make a comment that this would apply to the third Brown and Bihar, and you should have. Um, Mudita for your brother-in-law flying the helicopter mm. and not not be envious In order to be liberated one must overcome rites and rituals. There is a rule we cannot indulge in food if we make a, a 
bowl as healthy as possible. Bosom of Cain indulged in the sensual pleasure related to eating. Bosom of Mason killed carrots in making an effort to not indulge in sensual pleasure, a form of how do you a form of becoming. How do you experience with paper related to non becoming and sensual pleasures? Okay, the the important thing to understand is uh, and this could be like a whole whole Dhamma talk on uh, sensuality and sense pleasures. Um, people misunderstand those teachings. There's nothing uh, unethical or sinful about sens sensual pleasure, enjoying the taste of the the, uh, the kale is not nothing wrong with that. Um, the uh, the issue is that well, if one is focused on sensual pleasures, one never gets beyond that sense uh, realm existence. It's a, it's a limitation. It's not evil or or immoral, but it's it's. Um, it's a limitation on the mind. So we, uh, and, and a very important um, aspect of developing meditation is sense restraint, because we're trying specifically to get beyond the senses. So we, we're trying, it's not, and not just sensual pleasure, but we're trying to not go out through the senses for any reason because you're trying to go inward. So that's why when we are on the meditation retreat, it's advisable to take the eight precepts because the eight precepts give you a framework that um, helps with sense restraint by cutting off some avenues of sensual exploration. So you're not doing that. Uh, uh, the primary rule around food in the eight precepts is not eating in the afternoon. There, there's no, there's nothing sinful about eating in the afternoon. It's not an immoral act. But we restrain from it, and so we have a half-day fast. So you're not uh, it going out through the senses. Yeah. If you're eating, when you're eating three times a day and you're maybe snacking even beyond that, you're always sort of, you're never very far away from the, the experience of, of feeding. You know, the mind doesn't get really a chance to break away from that, and to be, be beyond that. So we, uh, we restrain from uh, sense, uh, sense indulgence. As an, as an effort to get beyond the senses, and to go inward rather than outward. So also, another point is that the sensation, if you're eating, you know, the, eating the, the meal and you enjoy the taste, that's a resultant factor. That's neither morally good nor bad. That's just pleasant resultant. And there's no, nothing either positive or negative about that. It's just an experience. Um, so the, uh, that sensual pleasure of experience and taste is not the problem. It's then craving it, desiring it, seeking it out, obsessing over it. Those are, are the problems. Why would one become a hungry ghost? How do you help such beings if they are aroused as the family members? How do you know who goes to which realm? Uh, the last question first, we, we don't know for sure what realm people have gone to. Um, uh, generally, we don't know. There, it, it's a, a psychic power Some that's possible that some beings develop. There's a story in the 
the suttas about somebody who had the psychic power, he could take the skull of someone who had died and knock on the skull. And from the sound, he could tell you where, where the person was born. And someone gave him the skull of an arahant, and he kept banging it, banging it. One becomes a hungry ghost generally if you die with a lot of uh, attachment and craving. Uh, the way I see it, a hungry ghost existence is kind of like a incomplete death. There's still a, it's like an aborted death process because you're so attached to existence that you then hang around attempting to experience the human existence, but it's over. The body's now not functional, so you can't. It's not possible. So there's a great deal of suffering. You can't enjoy the pleasures you did as a human being, but you're still trying to. And uh, very often the ghosts don't even know that they're dead. They're confused. They're in a great state of confusion. So, for example, in uh, the custom is in Thailand when someone dies that uh, the body is cremated. The exception they make is if someone dies by violence or, or suddenly, particularly if it's by violence, but even if it's like in an accident and they die suddenly, uh, they, they'll often bury them rather than cremate them because the idea is that the ghost will be wandering around will eventually be attracted to the grave site and realize that he's dead and pass on because of dying suddenly, you don't, it's often can be a cause of that confusion. You don't know you're dead. And you're suffering because you don't know why you, you, you're floating around your house and you don't know why everyone doesn't speak to you and you know, why they moved your things out of the house. And <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, this is how uh, ghosts are, um, or otherwise, you know, if someone is very attached to their, to their home or their possessions, their, you know, their, their existence, they, they may just hang around as a ghost, attempting to, to continue to experience it. Um, the best thing is to do is uh, making merit this is something very often done in Buddhist countries. You, you, you do a good deed, you make a, a wish, an earnest wish, may, may this go to the benefit of my relatives in the ghost realm. And sometimes the question is asked, what if you don't have any relatives in the ghost realm? And the answer is that you do. <laughs> 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 not, not from this life, from previous lives. You're bound to have some somebody hanging around in the ghost realm. <laughs> so, so it'll even if you say, you know, may this go to my my mother, and she's not in the ghost realm, it'll still it'll the merit still gets passed on to somebody. I have a question. Yes. Um, so, so uh, if you die, you'll be born in heaven, right? Is it possible to practice meditation in heaven and reach nirvana? It, it is, but it's much more difficult. In the sensual heavens, it is possible for beings to uh, uh, reach stages of enlightenment, but it's much more difficult because you're overwhelmed by the pleasures and you don't realize there's, a, there's an issue. There's a story of uh, Saka, the king of the gods, who was given some teachings by the Buddha. And Moggallana uh, wanted to check up on him. So he goes up to the Tower of Tinks of Heaven and uh, he finds Saka uh, seated in the midst of his retinue of musicians and dancing girls. And he asks Saka, uh, how are you getting on with those teachings the Buddha gave you? And he says, oh, I very good teachings. And, you know, I'm, I'm a busy man. I've got many things to do. <laughs> 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 so, 
know, so you get you just get lost in the pleasures and you kind of you forget yourself. So the human realm is the ideal position for practice and meditation and realizing higher states of consciousness because here there's a mixture of pleasure and pain. The lower realms you're overwhelmed by pain and it, you, you're helpless. And in the higher realms it's possible but it's more difficult because you're lost in the bewilderment of so much pleasure that you don't even you keep thinking, oh, there's no urgency. Yeah. Okay, let, maybe we'll go through the written questions first. Okay. <laughs> Is it okay to put the cat in the basement while we meditate? Oh. <laughs> He's in the attic. <laughs> He's in the attic? Okay. Uh, yeah, he, he is a noisy little bugger sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do the chakras and kundalini have anything to do with Buddhism? Um, we don't find explicit mentions of chakras and kundalini systems in Theravada Buddhism. In uh, Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about it a lot. Um, I, I, I think there's some overlap and I mentioned it talking about jhanas, I think that the PT is, is a very similar idea to Kundalini. So it's that energy moving movement in the body. But the Theravada generally hasn't not made an emphasis on um, these kind of uh, uh, en body energy developments. This is something that's been developed to a great degree in, uh, in in Tibetan Buddhism, but not in, in Theravada. Okay, I got two more two more questions. My mother wishes me death for changing my religion and being spiritual. Should I offer her metta as a mother or an enemy? Is she my <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. I don't know, that's uh, <laughs> probably if you're doing the list, the, the spirit of the list is the idea is your parents should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> if the case is that they're not, then you can put her in that last position as in the enemy position and hopefully with time you, she can get promoted back, <laughs> back in the proper place. <laughs> Are Hindu concepts such as the Yuga cycles of humanity, spiritual decline, also part of Buddhism? Uh, not exactly the same, but they're similar. There is a um, uh, a teaching about the um, cycles of time is part of the mythological or cosmological teachings that the uh, uh, the human race goes through various stages of decline uh, and, and, and ascension alternately and the accepted model is that currently we're on the down slope we're, we're heading heading into uh, um, uh, worse worse conditions, worse morality, and uh, what goes along with that is shorter lifespans. And the um, the very bottom, the nadir of existence, is they call the sword time when. Uh, human beings will have degenerated to basically an animal-like existence and have a lifespan of 10 years. And uh, uh, for seven days, they will do nothing but hack at each other with swords until they're almost all wiped out. And the few survivors will say, why are we hacking each other with swords? Why don't we stop killing? And just by making that one 
uh, ethical um, consideration, they, they start on the upslope and their lifespan starts increasing again. <clears throat> and they get gradually more refined and more moral and the lifespan keeps increasing until it reaches a peak of 80,000 years, a lifespan of 80,000 years. And that's when Mateya, the second Buddha, is supposed to come. So there's this, and this, there's the uh, implication that this cycling up and down ha happens many, many times in the course of a world system. Okay, so now, that's all the written questions. You had one more? Uh, yeah, I had another question. So I read, I, read this, I read a Buddhist story where uh, uh, is it possible to, to coexist in um, states of consciousness different realms simultaneously? For instance, like uh, I read that story where there's a heavenly being who fell asleep, but his sleep was reborn in a different state. And after he, after he, after he passed away, he woke up in his previous uh, existence. Um. <sighs> Well, the time, uh, if I'm thinking of the same story, I don't know. The, the, uh, the time scales, the point is the time scales are different in the different realms. And there's this story about um, uh, Dewas that are playing in the, in the grove, and one of the female Dewas dies, and for them to die is just like they disappear. There's no suffering involved, they just poof. And she's reborn as a human being, but she has a memory. She has, uh, for some reason, she has a memory of her existence as a Dewa. And she says, how did I get to this human place? I gotta get back to my Dewa pleasures. So she spends her whole life making merit and doing good deeds and always making the wish and the aspiration, may I be reborn in Talatings of Heaven. And she lives to be like 120 years old and dies and is reborn and appears back in the in the grove and the other ones barely missed her. And they say, Where were you? We, we didn't see you for a little bit. <laughs> and they're still at the same day for them. They're still playing about. She tells them the story and they're amazed. You know, that human life is, is so short. How can this be? The best way to understand the difference is to uh, think about perception. A perception is how we make sense of the information that's coming in through the senses. How we organize it. We get data from the senses, eyes, ears, nose, so on. We get information and then perception creates a simulation, basically. So we never really touch the outer world directly. We get signals, specific data points coming in, and uh, perception organizes that and creates a simulation that we live in. And in the waking state, that simulation will be fairly accurate. And it's based, and it's um, based uh, strongly on the incoming sense signals so that it's constrained. It can be fooled. Sometimes perceptions can get wrong for various reasons. It might be a damage to sense organs, physical organs, or it might be a confusion in the mind. But uh, generally, as a general rule, the, the perception is accurate enough that we can function. It reflects the outer world, and we're living in a kind of a, a reflection or a shadow of the Outer world. When, uh, when we're asleep and dreaming, that perception still functions, but now it's no longer based or controlled up by the senses. It's free ranging, so to speak. So it, it just makes stuff up. 
uses scraps of memory and imagination and just creates a, a world to live in that's entirely uh, fictitious, that's made up. So that, that um, but the faculty of perception is operating in both cases. So, so the waking state, we're actually dreaming this world, but the dream is, is realistic, it's based on inputs. So it has a realistic basis most of the time. If we're not you know, messed off, hallucinating in some way, then it's, it's pretty accurate. But when we're dreaming, we've shut off the sense doors, mostly, and what's happening is just, you know, just a, a creation of the mind. So, I'm sorry, so when you our awareness that we are dreaming in a dream is the same awareness as when we're awake and lost in the form. Yes. And we realize we're lost in the Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the chitta, the consciousness is present you know, all the time. <coughs> but generally when we're, when we're dreaming, it's pretty dull, it's confused. But it is possible to uh, have lucid dream, dreaming, where you're conscious in the dream fully, you know you're dreaming. Um, so then you have a higher degree of consciousness in the dream state, but you're still dreaming. I'll, I'll say uh, something about this lucid dreaming, if, if anyone wants to experiment with it. One method of inducing it that's pretty effective is uh, during the course of your ordinary day as you're going about your business several times during the day five, six times just stop for a few seconds and ask yourself very seriously am I sleeping and dreaming this or is this real? <laughs> and uh, make that a habit and then after a few days or a week or so it'll come up in your dream You'll, you'll ask yourself in the dream, am I, am I dreaming this or is this real? And the first time it happens, you might be confused and not, not realize <laughs> what's going on. But at, at some point, you will say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming this. And you'll be fully aware that you're dreaming, you're fully conscious, but you're in a dream state. That's quite interesting. <laughs> Some techniques you practice uh, mindfulness and death meditation? Mindfulness and death? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the Marana Sati meditation, mindfulness and death, is essentially a contemplation to remind yourself again and again that you are going to die and to make that real for yourself. Um, to you know, to bring up that contemplation often you know, uh, that this, this body is impermanent, uh, that the days are passing, and uh, every every day, every moment, you're that much closer to death, and it's inevitable, and we can't know the time or the place. But the only thing we know for certain is that it will happen. To make that make that a reality for yourself rather than avoiding it. You, you had a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is about um, cultivating the mudita, and there, I I know there are many beings in this world who derive joy or pleasure as a, at the expense of others as a sort of masochistic joy and um, in the example of the man on the elephant I wonder uh, if anyone asks how the elephant feels uh, as being captive or um, people who derive their joy from subjugating others or harming others yeah. is, are they 
is it appropriate or responsible to cultivate moody temperaments? No. No, I would say not it would not be a not be a skillful focus uh, to focus on some being who takes joy in cruelty to others. That would not be you know, that that would that would be too problematic to try and develop in detail in that case. You want someone who's enjoying a worldly pleasure but without you know, without causing distress and oppression to others. Um, I actually just changed my question, but I guess my question is, could it appear that the man on the elephant is doing some sort of uh, harm, yet he's really doing some good, or vice versa, for example, like the bombing of ISIS, who we killed more innocent people than we did guilty people, yet yeah. we thought it was something good. Now, it could be reversed where the person appears to be some, doing some sort of harm to the perceiver, however, that's just being perceived and it's not reality. Yeah, well, also, you're not, it's, this is kind of, um, well, both of these questions, it's kind of a slightly misdirected sense of, of, of Mudita. Because Mudita is not judging the morality of, of beings. But it, it's just uh, focusing on their, their happiness. You know, may they continue to be happy. So it's non-judgmental. It's the same with uh, all, the, all of the um, Brahma Viharas. You're not judging the morality of beings. That's important. So you still have metta for you know for everybody, even if they're evil wrongdoers, and you still have compassion, particularly for everybody. Also, medita, you know, may they continue to enjoy happiness. But I would just say, as a, you don't want to narrow the focus on. I I, I can see it as a problematic mind state if you're going to look at someone who's enjoying being cruel. That's not the individual you should be focusing on as an example. Can you explain when some masters are created, the crystals are formed, the sharira, and then that is distributed to either yeah. people in the stupor or different monasteries. Yeah. Um, how do we, like, get some? You know, because, like, let's just say if we want to open up our own uh, um, monastery eventually or something like that. I don't how know. is that passed down? I don't, I don't know. You, um, I don't know where you could acquire them if you're not gifted them. It's like often, they, you know, if you have if you have a teacher who's got some, and they, you know, and then you you uh, you're setting up something of your own, he may gift you with some. You know, pra, in Thai they call it pradat, you know, the uh, relics of a cremated arahant. Um, I don't really think you can, you can really just go out. And And do then do they guide everyone who's cultivating in that monastery, or how does that go? Um, well, it's to my way of thinking, it's more of a like a a focus of reverence and aspiration. You know, is it because there is some there is like a physical trace that occurs that doesn't occur when you cremate an ordinary person. You get these like pearl like objects in the cremated ashes of the master. It's quite it's quite unique. Um, but I, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put too much 
I think it become it becomes like a um, right ritual clinging or superstition to put too much emphasis on that kind of physical thing because it's not doesn't have any power. Nothing has outside of you has the power to liberate you. You have to do that by your own effort. But these kind of things can just serve as a as a focus of reverence and aspiration. This morning, uh, when you were talking about samadhi, you uh, made a distinction between narrowing your focus on the breath. And yeah. I think you said filling your mind with the breath. Yes. And I, I think I understand what you mean. Um, yeah. But I wonder if maybe you could say a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, I think that's the primary mistake that um, I've seen people trying to develop samadhi that they, they do is that they, in a sense, they try too hard, that they push their mind onto the object and they, they kind of try and narrow it down. And um, the, I think this comes in large part from the use of the uh, unskillful use of language has gotten fixed in our vocabulary when we talk about concentration. I'm trying very hard not to use that word anymore, but I still keep slipping up and using it because it's been such a part of the Buddhist vocabulary. And it's used to translate samadhi. But if we examine the original text where the samadhi is defined, it's defined as non-wavering or uh, stillness or stability. There's nothing about concentrating. So it's a non-moving of mind, right? But the mind is is open and vast and expansive, but it's it's not flickering. It's not moving from object to object. It's filled with a single object. So you you try and let the the object completely fill the mind and drive everything else out, so that there's only this one object and. Uh, you don't do that by trying to wall it in. You, you do that by, by uh, cultivating stillness and uh, this little trick of non-attention. When other things arise in the mind, you just disregard them. So you let them natter away in the background until they fade of their own accord. And you just keep filling up the spaces of the mind more and more with this single object. This question kind of relates to the that contemplation question. Uh, however, uh, I'd like to bring up something from Ajahn Chah's Stillness of Well Mind. Um, and so, in Ajahn Chah's biography, they talk about how he was in the pre meditation forest. Yeah. And uh, he had these experiences where he kind of uh, almost like saw death in front of him and not like trying to view his body as decaying necessarily, but in, in like he thought he was going to die because there was a wolf outside his tent. Um, and so I guess, you know, and then shortly after that, it seemed like he kind of went through uh, the three, three of the four forms of things. They didn't talk about him going into Nirvana, but um, I'm wondering if, um, do you think it's possible, so they had talked about him kind of imagining these creatures outside his tent. Do you think it's kind of possible to go into these mind states of like adrenaline or of um, looking at death right in the eyes? And do you think that that has any impact on the spiritual life or not? Yeah, uh, well getting past, I don't think adrenaline's got anything to do with it. But getting past the, uh, the fear of death by going through it. You have to confront it. You know, the way out is down and through. You have to confront that fear and get to the other side of it, is what Ajahn Chah did. <coughs> so I think that's probably enough, uh, enough questions for now. We'll, we'll leave that and um, uh,